sunshine, rain, and snow. Welcome to Iowa. Right? <laughs> we are glad you are all here with us today. Um, I would ask that we keep Julie Weiger in our prayers. Um, her son passed away um, Wednesday, right? Yeah. So let's keep her and her family in our prayers. Um, do we have other announcements? Prayers are also the Dave Shaw family. The Dave Shaw family? Okay. The Captain and Oh, okay. So prayers for the Dave Shaw family. And Pam? Yes. 
Um, on the back table here, you'll see some of the things that uh, the fellowship will be selling for um, our church's 150th uh, anniversary. Uh, it's a fundraiser. So we're sorting on pricing, but you can kind of get an idea of a couple of the items. Thank you to Deb for the use of the pictures. And um, I'm so pleased to have all the items she got here to introduce us some of them. So working on that. There'll be uh, t-shirts and sweatshirts to come to. So uh, watch that area. We'll have a sign up to them things you want to order. There'll also be something in the newsletter. So. Awesome. Awesome. So lots of uh, new trinkets for the 150th anniversary of this congregation. Yeah. Our church supper is this coming Wednesday evening, and I'm excited because it's baked ham and cheese potatoes and green beans and the raspberry jelly salad that my family loves, loves, loves. So I'm hoping you will too. So hope to see everybody on Wednesday night. I think we have our ticket sales are kind of stopped, so that we could get a cold count to turn in for groceries, but I think there might be just a couple of tickets left here and there. So if you need one or two, let me know. Okay. And the next evening is the Kiwanis Roast Beef Dinner. If you happen to even need a ticket for that, I have some in my office. So there you go. Um, any other announcements you'd like to share? Okay, then let us turn our hearts and minds to God. Please stand and join me in our call to worship. With grace flowing, the poet sings the opening lines of the famous prayer. This Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Settled on the ground with grass tickling their toes, the psalmist reads, grass, sorry. God makes me lie down in green pastures. She leads me beside still water. She restores my soul. <laughs> With a deep sigh, the psalmist declares, Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil, for you are with me. You prepare a table before me. You anoint me. My cup overflows. Remembering God's faithfulness, the psalmist finds words to carry with them. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord my whole life long. Holy Spirit of rest and renewal, in this time of worship, Inspire us with words both ancient and new, so that we may find the words that connect us to you.
Join me in our prayer of confession and brokenness. Holy One, we hear the comforting ancient poetry of the psalmist, but wonder, is it true? Will you really provide for what we need? Will you bring us to the place of rest? Will you protect us from enemies, even when they share our dinner table? We confess that rather than being only filled with holy wonder, we are also filled with skepticism at the ancient words. We can quickly tally up the times we don't feel provided for or protected from danger. We count the times we could not catch a break when we desperately needed it. So, Holy One, shepherd our busy minds back to the here and now. Help our spirits forgive the grudges we hold and invite us to experience you as truly present. In these moments of quiet, offer us rest for a moment. God's love is relentless and will offer us goodness and mercy all the days of our life. Thanks be to God. Amen. Please be seated. So a change in our lineup of people helping today. Um, in addition to her daughter being at the prom last night, Lisa got called into work. So, I get to be liturgist too. From 1 John chapter 3, verses 16 through 24, we hear these words. This is how we know love. Jesus laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. But if someone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need but refuses to help, how can the love of God dwell in that person? Little children, let's not love with words or speech, but with action and truth. This is how we will know that we belong to the truth and reassure our hearts of God's presence. Even if our hearts condemn us, God is greater than our hearts and knows all things. Dear friends, if our hearts don't condemn us, we have confidence in relationship to God. We receive whatever we ask from him because he keeps his commandments and does what pleases him. This is his commandment, that we believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love each other as he commanded. Those who keep his 
commandments shall dwell in God, and what God dwells in them. This is how we know that he dwells in us, because of the spirit he has given us. And we also hear from the Gospel of John, chapter 10, verses 11 through 18. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. When the hired hand sees the wolf coming, he leaves the sheep and runs away. That's because he isn't the shepherd. The sheep aren't really his. So the wolf attacks the sheep and scatters them. He is only the hired hand, and the sheep really don't matter to him. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep, and they know me. Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, I gave up my life for these sheep. I have other sheep that don't belong to this sheepfold. I must love them too. They will listen to my voice, and there will be one flock with one shepherd. This is why the Father loves me. I gave up my life so that I can take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I give, gave it up because I want to. I have the right to give it up, and I have the right to take it up again. I received this commandment from my Father. Here ends our reading. May God grant us understanding. So if you haven't already guessed, um, from the scripture readings um, and the words in our litany, today is what we call in the church Good Shepherd Sunday. Throughout the scriptures, the importance of the shepherd is spoken of. Genesis tells us of the offering of um, herdsman Abel, that his offering is more pleasing than the offering of the plant tender Cain. Now, your farmers probably don't want to hear that. I get it. Jacob grew wealthy as a transfer or as a, um, as a tender of the flocks. Moses was out tending the flocks of his father-in-law when he saw the burning bush. David was a shepherd boy and became anointed as king. The birth of Christ is announced to the shepherds out in the field. Jesus uses the image of the shepherd searching for the lost sheep as a metaphor when he talks about the kingdom of God. And certainly, not least among the shepherd references is Jesus' description of himself as the good shepherd. Shepherds and their sheep are an intricate part of the Christian story. We can even find images of Jesus as a shepherd scattered among our Western art. And if you've ever been to um, a service in the Roman Catholic Church, um, when the bishop is present, or even seen a service with the Pope, they will, the bishop and the Pope, walk in with what we call the shepherd's crook. It resembles what the shepherds used out in the fields with their sheep. Even the title of pastor for Christian clergy is related to pasture, to tending herds. Not that I think of you all as a herd. But that's what it refers to. The image we have of the Good Shepherd is one of trust and confidence that we are loved. We recognize that we are to be like the Good Shepherd, 
and demonstrate those acts of love. The thing is, though, sheep, when I think of sheep, I don't think of a really highly intelligent animal. <laughs> They're not independent. They can't defend themselves. They don't even stampede. Ever heard of a sheep stampede? Nope. Sheep just kind of meander. And if they get scared, they scatter all over the place. Sheep without a shepherd are vulnerable to their enemies, like wolves and thieves. They are also vulnerable to themselves, as they kind of tend to wander from the flock now and then. But, you know, I, she probably don't sit there and think, hmm, if I wander off, I might be putting myself in danger. Right? <clears throat> so they just meander away. As human beings, we are probably creation's most complex thinkers. We can understand and process exceptional quantities of facts and information. We can make complicated decisions. We're not a whole lot like sheep. And so why does Jesus compare us to sheep? Why does he call us his sheep? Shouldn't we feel kind of insulted by that comparison? Or are we perhaps more like sheep than we realize? Perhaps sheep aren't the most intelligent, but they know exactly who they can trust. They aren't easily distracted by another shepherd. In fact, you can have several flocks in one field, in one fold, when, and several shepherds standing amongst the, that fold in different locations. And if the shepherd calls, no matter where they are in the field, the sheep will go to their shepherd. Every sheep will only follow his or her shepherd. We, the people of God, have been placed in an exceptionally large field called the earth. Many voices call to us to come and join them. There's the voice of materialism, the voice of consumerism, the voice of entertainment, and on and on. Lots of voices, right? We pride ourselves on our independence of being shepherds in control rather than sheep in need of following. We think of sheep as weak, being led to the slaughter by the wolves around them. We forget. We forget that the shepherd is nearby, ready and willing to call us away from the danger. As humans, we can choose if we will listen to the voice of the shepherd calling out to us. Our shepherd Jesus loves us silly sheep beyond all measure. He will, and did, 
everything to protect us. The writer of First John calls us to live our lives with the same passion as Jesus the shepherd. This means that we need to put ourselves in the line of fire, that we need to risk our reputations so that we can keep others safe. But some of us, some of us stay in, in um, some of us stay in the tomb or the barn, maybe. Because it's simpler. When we stay inside that tomb, that barn, with, with the dead shepherd, then we can ignore the world around us. But you know what? The shepherd didn't stay in that tomb, in that barn. He left it. And he expects us to follow him out of the tomb. Following the shepherd and being part of the herd that offers safety and comfort to, to another is what God called us to do. In all of Jesus' interactions with his sheep, even those outside of his fold, Jesus never asked for suggestions of what they should do. He didn't ask for their input. Never did you hear Jesus say, huh, should we go feed the hungry today? Do you think it's appropriate that that guy over there is naked? Which one of us should go visit the sick? Instead, Jesus said, come on, follow me. We're going to go feed the hungry. We're going to, to clothe the naked. We're going to go visit the sick. We're going to love those who are not like us. We're going to accept those who don't even pray like us or eat like us, or love like us, or even vote like us. Our shepherd, our shepherd is the greatest of all time. He takes us into his fold, one and all. And he offers us everything we need. How many of you have ever had a dog? Yeah. When you put food in the bowls, does the dog sit there and patiently wait for it? Yeah, not usually. No. They usually have it consumed before it even hits the bowl, right? Well, in uh, his essay for Working Preacher this week, Matt Skinner shared a story about his German, or his dog, Sprocket. Sprocket was a German Shepherd. And unlike Matt's British Labrador, um, Sprocket taught Matt what, most of what he knows about Shepherd. And now let me clarify, just because it's a German Shepherd does not mean that they know how to Shepherd. We had one that didn't. However, for Matt, Sprocket was the consummate shepherd. It seems that Sprocket would usually, or wouldn't eat his food when it was put in his bowl each evening. Instead, he would wait. He would wait sometimes for hours. He would wait until the children had gone to bed. Because it was then that Sprocket knew he could take his attention off of everything else for a few moments 
and be alone with his dinner. Matt noted that there was never any doubt that Sprocket was there for them, watching them, protecting them. Every person who stood up and moved to a different room, every squirrel that passed by the door, every creek in the building, Sprocket investigated. Matt noted that he doesn't, um, he doesn't think there's any substitution for the feeling of security that comes from knowing you're the object of someone's constant care and concern. If he couldn't protect me from all harm, wrote Matt, it wouldn't have been from lack of time. That is the type of protection Jesus offers each of us. We will face harm. And indeed, we might even get hurt. But it certainly won't be from the lack of Jesus trying to protect us. Physically, mentally, emotionally. That is why we have been given the chance to love and care to shepherd others. It is through us that the shepherd Jesus now leads. When we follow Jesus and act as the shepherd and not the wolf or the hired man, then we are working to enfold God's sheep into the loving arms of the Good Shepherd. Let us be sheep. Let us be sheep that follow the Shepherd so that others will know His love. Amen.
Savior on behalf of the church, the world, and all people. Jesus, thank you for being our good shepherd. For the lovely pictures that show us how you lead and carry spotless sheep through the grassy meadows with not a speck of dust on you or them. But we know where life is messy and dirty. And stone. Thank you for bearing us and hearing with us through all and everything. Thank you for leading us safely <coughs> to our Father's house. Defend your church, Lord, from peril. Provide us, provide for its needs. Lead it in paths of righteousness and holiness. Through its ministry, lead us to hear your voice and follow you. Teach us to be, to do your will with glad and faithful hearts. Use us to lead others into your safety. Bless the pastors and the staff and make us faithful sheep to us for your flock. Faithful shepherd, defend and strengthen your people when they are set upon by wolves and prosecutors, persecutors, sorry. Bring peace in place of violence, rich pastures in place of poverty, and true righteousness in place of justice. And healing shepherd, comfort those who are in pain, lonely in heart, struggling to get through the day. May your healing be upon those whose names are on our prayer list and those whose names are in our hearts and on our lips, especially Julie and her family, Alice Arnold and her family. David Brownfield, and the Shaw family. Hear our prayers, our great shepherd, as we join in the prayer that you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debts. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Like a shepherd, <coughs> excuse me, tending to those in, in their care, God has offered us rest and renewal, protection, and mercy, love, and nourishment. In response, we are invited to give a portion of our time, our energy, our gifts, our prayers, so that others in the world may experience the same. Please remember to continue giving um, so the mission of the church can continue. Do that by check. By electronic payment, whatever you wish. Please join me in our prayer of dedication. Loving God, bless these gifts in all the ways in which we give. May each of our gifts be a part of co creating and tending to the love, safety, belonging, and dignity you envision for the world. Amen.
place. Go with courage and go with trust. That the God who created you is also the one that will sustain you. And the one who will show you the way. Until we meet again, may you be filled with curiosity, wonder, and openness to God's tender leading. Go in peace. Amen. Amen.